the digital world has transformed our lives, creating new ways of communicating, organizing and accessing information. It has also created new threats, popularly known as cyber threats. In response, cyberspace is increasingly being framed as something inherently dangerous, which requires more scrutiny, management and control. In this video, we'll explore why this framing is itself a threat to both human rights and the security of the digital environment. By the end, you'll understand the dominant ways threats in cyberspace are being framed, why this framing can be problematic, and how to get involved in these debates. In 2016, US Director of National Intelligence James Clapper delivered a talk to a Naval Academy. In his speech, he said, The cyber threat is here. It's upon us now and we need the people here today to help us defend our systems and our nation. This statement neatly captures the two dominant perspectives on threats in cyberspace. The political military perspective, focused on threats to public safety and the security of the state, and the economic perspective, focused on threats to commercial systems and assets. Both understand cyber threats as malicious activity that seeks to undermine computer networks or systems and the information accessible through them. In media and policy spaces, these threats are discussed under many names. Data breaches, hacks, cyber incidents and cyber attacks are just a few examples. But what do these threats actually constitute? You may recall incidents like the 2015 Sony Pictures hack, a major data breach which attracted extensive media coverage and political responses and was estimated to have cost the company millions of dollars. Or the 2007 wave of attacks on Estonian public service websites and major news outlets, which was characterised as an act of cyber war. These fit in with the systems-focused perspectives we've discussed, but some activities characterised as cyber threats stretch the boundaries of this framing. In Turkey, for example, hundreds of people have been investigated by the Cyber Crime Unit for insulting the president. Here, a cyber threat can be taken to mean activities which simply involve the use of an information technology. This blurs the line between activities which affect the integrity of online systems and networks and activities which simply involve the internet as a medium. It means an art thief who uses Google Maps to escape and someone who hacks into a banking website could both be considered cyber criminals. And with cybercrime increasingly overlapping with a range of policy debates, from internet governments to child safety and counter-terrorism, defining where these boundaries sit is only going to become more important. We've established that there are ambiguities around how a cyber threat is defined. But why does this matter? Some argue that the looseness of the term feeds into securitized narratives, which present cyberspace as inherently threatening. This can then justify disproportionate measures which undermine human rights. In other words, when everything is deemed a potential cyber threat, proportionality and due process can often be forgotten. Let's be clear, there are real threats in cyberspace. And unless we're protected against them, our everyday lives will suffer. Major public services and businesses now depend on the security of networks and systems. And without proper measures in place, the huge amounts of sensitive information we share about ourselves, like our sexual orientation, political activity or location, is vulnerable to misuse. But a securitized reading of cyber threats can create new threats for both people and systems. For example, a ban on encryption in the name of terrorism and cybercrime doesn't just damage human rights like privacy and freedom of expression. It weakens security too by creating more vulnerabilities in systems. A backdoor, after all, is a backdoor to anyone, whether that's a policeman or a criminal. So many of our rights depend on our networked information infrastructure. It's what enables us to communicate, organize, associate, create and distribute content. If we want to retain these benefits, we need to fight for a more balanced understanding of cyberspace and the things which threaten it. Without considering rights, there can be no real security. Threats in cyberspace are discussed in a range of forums, dealing with issues related to cybersecurity, cybercrime and cyber warfare, among others. Apart from national cybersecurity strategies, governments are developing norms of responsible state behaviour in a number of global forums, notably the UN Group of Governmental Experts in the First Committee of the UN General Assembly. Similar efforts are being discussed and developed in regional bodies like the European Union, the African Union, the Organisation of American States and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. 
Bilateral agreements, like the one signed between the US and China, attempt to define rules of procedure and mutual notification systems in case of an attack. Consultations on the Talon Manual 2.0 are also ongoing. This initiative, often associated with NATO, is actually an independent academia-led effort seeking to adapt international law for peace and wartime to the digital age. Most countries have established computer emergency response teams which help identify, isolate and safeguard against viruses, hacking or DDoS attacks. These certs cooperate across borders through the FIRST network, which focuses on information sharing and threat notification. In addition, there are several discussions taking place on so-called responsible disclosure. This means allowing detected vulnerabilities in systems and networks to be safely disclosed without legal persecution. This happens both at the national and regional levels. Finally, threats are often discussed at conferences and policy forums, like the Global Conference on Cyberspace, DEFCON, Black Hat, the cybercrime conferences hosted by Europol and Interpol and PETS. The U.S. Personnel Department was hacked in 2015, exposing the sensitive personal information of 22 million people, including mental health records and details of drug and alcohol abuse. In both human rights and security terms, this was a catastrophe, demanding urgent action to strengthen protections. This didn't happen. Instead, the incident was framed in a securitized way, with US officials looking for states to blame and weighing options for retaliation. This prevented any real debate on an appropriate response, which might have included a discussion on whether so much data should have been collected in the first place. This is an example of what can happen when policy discussions are led by a security agenda. A narrow debate makes a constructive, holistic approach less likely. Pakistan's Prevention of Electronic Crimes Bill has been under negotiation since 2015. It aims to fight crime and terrorism by restricting the ability of these actors to organize and communicate online. To do this, the bill seeks to criminalize the production, distribution and use of encryption tools. This is a good example of a disproportionate measure in response to a securitized framing of a threat. The bill makes no distinction between the tiny number of users who might use anonymity for criminal purpose and the vast majority of users who simply wish to protect their right to privacy. It also threatens free speech by criminalizing content deemed to praise those accused of a crime. The bill is not only an ineffective approach to fighting crime, it also threatens online security and data protection and undermines free expression online. Human rights defenders can engage with these issues on several levels. As individuals, we can step up efforts to strengthen our own digital security and help raise awareness of the dangers that come with digitization. We can encourage and support businesses in bringing their internal capacities up to speed and make sure they're following human rights and data protection standards. We can intervene in the spaces where threats are discussed to make sure a more proportionate, rights-respecting definition of cyber threats takes hold. And we can push governments to put in place adequate legislation and policies which put responsible limits on the power of intelligence and law enforcement agencies. Music